Now let's look at what has happened to population in the past. You all have heard that the population has grown very rapidly, especially during the past century, starting in the 1950s. We have a big rise in the number of people in the world from 2 billion around 1900 to 2.5 billion in 1950 and eventually to 7 billion just last month. So you see there's an acceleration of population growth. To see it another way, this is the rate at which the world population has been changing, and you see that it's a lot less smooth than the rise in the population numbers. You see there that uh, there was a high, slight high in the early 1900s with a dip that is caused by the World War, and then another rise around 1950, and then a peak is reached at the late 1960s. And from there on, there has been a, a non-steady but a decline in the growth rate. The peak of the growth rate of the world population was reached at 2% per year, as I tell you, in the late 1960s. And today, we have half that population growth rate to around 1% per year. But for anyone who has money in the bank, you know that even at 1% per year, the money is growing. Perhaps not very fast, but it's growing. So what are the... Today we have a world that is very divided because it's very heterogeneous. We have, I divide the world into three parts, and they're not the traditional parts. We have a world where of low fertility, and those are the low fertility countries, where we de I defined as low fertility the countries that don't, are not having enough, where women are not having enough children to reproduce themselves. And what does that mean in demography? It means that every woman to reproduce herself should have a daughter that survives to the age of reproduction so that the generations reproduce themselves. Um, the low fertility countries are countries where women are having fewer children than the ones necessary to ensure that each woman has a daughter to, that survives to the age of reproduction. And those populations account for 42% of the world population today, and they are 74 countries that are in the low fertility group. Those are the 42, 74 that you see in that, in that table. Then we have the intermediate fertility countries that I defined as the ones where the number of daughters go between one on average to one and a half on average for the women involved. And they are accounting today for 40% of the population, and they include 65 countries. And lastly, we have the high fertility countries that are those in which women are having, on average, more than one and a half daughters per woman. And they account for just 18% of the population, and there are 58 countries. So in order to make this clearer for you in terms of the world, I have produced this map whose colors I cannot see myself very well, but you can see the red colors in the map are the high fertility countries of today. And the main point that this map should make is that they are, most of these countries are in sub-Saharan Africa, but not all of them are in sub-Saharan Africa. We also have several in Asia. They are Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan and Pakistan, the Philippines, and several others that are too small to show in the map. And you have several others in Latin America, several of them in, in Central America, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Bolivia, and Haiti that you cannot see in the map. So they're not, these high fertility countries are not all concentrated only in Africa. They exist in other regions. First, I want to talk about the good news really is good news. We are defusing the population bomb. And we're doing it without draconian measures by big governments. Outside China, there is no one-child policy. It's being done largely without crackdowns on our liberties. And that's a really good news story, I think. The population bomb is being defused by the world's poorest women, like this mother and farmer in Cameroon. The people often seen as villains in the population story are turning into the heroes. This woman has told me she had one son. She may not be typical of Africa, but she's typical of a trend. She had one son and no plans for any more. Here is, 
I think if you remember one statistic from what I say, the one I would like you to remember at any rate, is this. Today's women have half as many children as their mothers and grandmothers did. The average now, when I wrote my book it was 2.6, it's now below 2.5. The average woman in the world today has fewer than two and a half children, whereas her mother and her grandmothers had five and six. And that's not just in the rich world, this is a global average today. What is going on is actually a reproductive revolution right around the world, right now. And it's, I think it's really odd that we don't hear much more about it. We have uncertainty in the basic figures. We have uncertainty about when exactly the population will cross or has crossed the 7 billion. For the future, the uncertainty is about how rapidly would fertility come down and I want to think like Fred that, yes, it's going to come down very quickly, but we have enough evidence to give us pause because we were expecting that since 1990, that Africa was going to follow the same path as Asia, and it hasn't done it. And the more we get real evidence about certain countries that were supposed to be having a fertility reduction, some of them are having increases in fertility that we certainly didn't expect. It's not universal, but you're seeing some of these change and not happening, and that's what give us pause now about whether it's going to be automatic that every country has its fertility coming down. In the late 1980s, beginning 1990s, we demographers thought, okay, fine, now it's the turn of Africa. Africa is going to go the way of Asia. We'll see fertility drop like a rock, and it's not doing it. And we have also evidence, I was telling him before, you ask women in Africa, how many children do you want to have? And even educated women in some countries, the young women who have tertiary education are saying they want five children. So what we do, what, then that goes to the last question that someone asked me. What made fertility go down? It was just the decisions of every woman saying, okay, I don't want to be a reproducing machine. What we know is that we don't know enough. We don't have a single answer, but there were conf co confluence of issues. One is that in many countries, women did get more of a say of when they were going to have children, how many children to have, via empowerment. There were also other options for women. They started seeing that they could go and work and then earn their own living, not just depend on husbands. But Fertility has fallen even in very poor countries like Bangladesh where the women who were reducing their fertility were illiterate. Many of them were subject to purda. That means they could even not get out of their houses without the permission of their husbands. And what we know there is that the government undertook a very serious family planning program by which they trained women to go and visit these women at home and talk to them about their needs, their needs in terms of their family, their needs about when they had children, telling them about how to take care of their children, vaccinate them, uh, feed them, uh, when to introduce more feeding than just breastfeeding, what, how to prevent diarrhea or how to treat the diarrhea of kids. And also they talked to them about how to prevent the next pregnancy so that it didn't happen too quickly, give them advice about family planning. If they had the, the means, the, if they wanted the pills, give them the pills there. If they wanted another method of family planning, refer them to clinics where they could go to get these methods. And all these subsidized by government so that these women had to pay nothing. That was the way of actually giving them the means of ensuring that if they wanted fewer children, they could have them.